how it's going to work today. Uh, we have with us Grand Chief Doug Kelly of the First Nations Health Council. We have Joe Gallagher, the Chief Executive Officer of the First Nations Health Authority, which is totally exciting that we are now not interim as of August. Online from Ottawa, we have Lynn Bernard. She's the Director General of the BC Tripartite Initiative. And Shannon McDonald will also speak, and she's the Executive Director of the Aboriginal Health Living Branch. And she is coming from Victoria. So each of the speakers will have seven or so minutes each. And then at the end of this, there will be sorry, time for question and answers from the floor. So if you can write down and hold all your questions until then, that will be fantastic. So welcome here. And uh, can I turn it over to Grand Chief Doug Kelly? Thanks, Leah. And, uh, good morning, everybody. Respected elders, chiefs, health directors, caregivers. Good morning. I'm uh, mindful this morning of a video that was prepared by our communications team navigating the currents of change. And I'm mindful of that graphic where our people began to travel by canoe. And as they went up the coast or down the coast, depending on which way you look at it, more and more canoes began to paddle in the same direction. More and more gathered to travel together to navigate those currents of change. And when they arrived on the beach, they saw this great big building. It wasn't quite the Sinclair Center, <laughs> but I suppose it could represent the Sinclair Center in Vancouver. And that's the journey that we're on now. We're in the middle of navigating change. What an exciting time and place to be. At the same time that some of us are really keen and really excited about the real change that we can make. Change in policy, programs, services. Change in the well-being of our grandchildren, our children, our families our communities and our nations. There's also anxiety. There's fear. There's doubt. There's uncertainty. And that's natural. That's human beings at their best and at their worst. It's just the way we're built. You know, and I'm so grateful that we've structured our work in the way that we have. Our assemblies are called Gathering Wisdom. Well, Joe calls it by its full name, but I call it Gathering Wisdom. And for me, that's what this work is about. For me, this is bringing our chiefs, our leaders, our health directors, our health leads together to share what we know to share our experiences and to give our views and our ideas about how to engage and carry out change. Shelly Lampro. And so in this work, in May 2011, at a historic assembly, British Columbia chiefs gave a significant decision and give work to the First Nations Health Council. I asked those 15 members, three from each of the five regions, to work together to negotiate all of the arrangements with Health Canada and the province of British Columbia to implement the decision to transfer the First Nations Inuit Health Branch 
from Health Canada control to the control of a First Nation self authority. That decision was huge. And the work is not done yet. They ask us to move mountains. And while we've knocked a couple of them down, we haven't finished moving all of the, the rock, all of the gravel, all of the debris from having knocked that mountain down. That work continues. In May this year, 2012, we gathered our chiefs, our leaders, our health directors, our health leads, and we reported on the progress. We reported on that work that we've been doing to date. And we were given additional marching orders. We haven't finished the work from May 2011, but chiefs wanted to be clear that the work continue. And so we have since those marching orders of May 2011 and 2012, that council has been doing that work. Our council is responsible for big P political policy, dealing with health ministers, dealing with deputy ministers, dealing with decision makers, and making sure that they understand our interests and our concerns. The First Nations Health Authority is actually responsible for the business funding, the hiring of staff, the looking after of the delivery of programs and services, all of the operations of the organization. Our chiefs in May 2011 asked us to keep our politics and our business separate. Not separate in the sense that we can have our business people run off and do whatever it is they want to do. We want that organization to be accountable. Accountable for the funding they receive. Accountable for the direction that they've received in terms of how to renew and change and revise and transform programs and services. To be accountable in terms of the direction that's been provided to create partnerships with others and to begin to work together with others to change the world in which we live. So the way that we've accomplished both of those marching orders is the members of the First Nations Health Council are also the members of the First Nations Health Authority. And under provincial law, we can establish a legal entity called a society. The society, by law, has a role for members and it has a role for directors. Our bylaws set out more clearly the responsibility for the members. The members have set out a accountability framework. It sets out a relationship between the members of the First Nations Health Authority and the board of directors of the First Nations Health Authority. Not for the members to micromanage or tell the board of directors what to do, but to make sure that there's report on progress, that problems and obstacles and impediments to progress are identified, discussed. And if the council has some political work to do to overcome some of those barriers, that we then do the work that we need to do as the First Nations Health Council. The bylaws provide that the members can appoint and or disappoint the board of directors. That's the responsibility of the members. The members are responsible to participate in an annual general assembly and to receive and accept the annual audit, to receive and accept the annual report and there's a number of different things that the members can do in respect of that work, but it's limited to those key themes. There's one more area of responsibility that the members are responsible for, and that's to amend the constitution 
and the bylaws of the First Nations Health Authority. And so we have done that work. We are working with Health Canada because in our negotiations with Health Canada and the province of British Columbia, we agreed upon a set of standards that would describe the ideal First Nations Health Authority, how it would be structured, how it would be developed and managed. And we worked with Health Canada to make sure that our constitution and our bylaws meet those standards. And so we now, as of uh, August, a month ago, or a little less than a month ago, we are now the First Nations Health Authority. And we changed the name as part of that journey, as we're beginning and continuing to navigate the currents of change, as we achieve significant outcomes, as we're ready to take on more, we're acknowledging that. And the First Nations Health Authority is going to be doing some very important work on July 2nd, 2013. Now many of you heard me here and you probably heard me in this very room on this very process of uh, electronic smoke signals. You've heard me say that we're going to transfer April 1. Well, I was insistent that we pursue that for a very simple reason. I know from driving in rush hour traffic that if you're not realistic about how long it can take to travel from downtown Sawali to downtown Vancouver, you can be late for meetings. You can be ill prepared for meetings. You can miss meetings, and I have missed a few. So I learned that I have to make sure that I allow as much time as I can, and I do, I go as fast as I can. You're not even any police on the line, are there? Anyway, so we reached a place last month where we had to assess how realistic is it that we can transfer April 1, 2013. And what we talked about amongst ourselves as Health Canada, the province of British Columbia, and the First Nations Health Council is, we could probably achieve transfer by April 1. But a year ago, we set a number of standards to measure a successful transfer. And some of those standards called for a seamless transfer. No disruption of services to citizens and to communities. No disruption of money flowing to community health programs. No disruption in terms of the ongoing business of health and health care and health care delivery for our citizens. And we realized that April 1st wasn't going to allow us to transfer and meet our standards for a successful transfer. So we decided to move the transfer date to July 2nd, 2013. That additional time will allow us to recruit some of the very senior executives that we need to provide leadership and support It'll give us the opportunity to complete the work that we need to do that we've been given by chiefs at Gathering Wisdoms 4 in May 2011 and to complete some, of, some more of the work that we were given to do in Gathering Wisdom 5 at May 2012. And it gives us a chance to make sure that on July 2nd, when we do complete that transfer, that it is seamless that the money flows through the communities for all of their agreements so they can provide services. That whatever we're doing on July 2nd in terms of provision of services, that there is no disruption. And so that's something that I wanted to share with you this morning. When you look at the framework agreement, it identifies a whole lot of work 
It identifies a number of sub-agreements that need to be carried out and completed. It identifies the need for a health partnership accord between the First Nations Health Council on behalf of BC First Nations, Health Canada on behalf of the Government of Canada, the BC Ministry of Health Services on behalf of the province of British Columbia. And we're doing that work now. And we have initialed a number of the agreements. We initialed those agreements in essence saying, for now, we're putting the pen down. We're putting the pen down on the Canada funding agreement. We're putting the pen down on the human resources subagreement. We're putting the pen down on the health benefits subagreement and the health benefits services contract. And we agreed at the table to a concept of business continuity and making sure that as Canada continues to invest in technology for its other federal departments, for other parts of Health Canada, that they don't lose sight of us, that they don't forget that we're an important part of that national health program, and that as Canada and other departments make progress in terms of the development of software and uh, other kinds of uh, uh, technology, that we continue to have access to those very important tools that allow our caregivers to do the work that they need to do. We're not intending to share the agreements until we've approved them. And we're in the midst now of receiving final, final, final federal approval. And I'm quite sure our partner, uh, Lynn Bernard, will, will speak to the details uh, of that process and where we're at. What we're doing is we're going to continue the work over the next couple of months of completing all of those other sub-agreements, working through each one of them because they're all interdependent. When we reach an understanding on HR, it has an impact on office space. It has an impact on technology and software. It has an impact on so many different things. And so our plan is, is to take each of those agreements, as sub-agreements as far as we can, initial them, put them down. And once we've completed the entire package, and then we'll look at it. Are these agreements workable in its entirety? Do each of these required agreements allow us to successfully implement transfer on July 2nd? And that's when the council and the board of directors for the First Nations Health Authority, together they'll make that call whether we've reached the kinds of agreements that allow us to achieve a timely and seamless successful transfer. So the last uh, speaking note that I've been given, I don't know if my seven minutes is up. <laughs> <laughs> Davis uh, fed me a coffee this morning and wound me up. <laughs> And so one of the things that, that I wanted to speak to, and it's, and it's really important for us to understand, when we started this work about three years ago, there was a really interesting debate and dialogue that we had in our own community. Some were saying, oh my God, you're moving way too fast. What's the hurry? What's going on? Why are we doing this so quickly? And others are saying, Oh man, the health status and our conditions is so bad. We're not moving fast enough. Get on with it, Kelly. What the hell's going on? Come on, get to work. And so we developed an approach that requires us to manage change. Not allowing change to manage us, but for us to manage change. And so it's really important then that we continue to follow those practices that we set out for ourselves. It's really important that each and every one of you, wherever you are in British Columbia, that you continue to support, participate, and engage in sub-caucus meetings, in regional caucus meetings. 
that you participate in that work to inform yourselves about where we're at in the work and where we're going, but also for you to share your ideas, your opinions, your advice, your recommendations on the no, kinds just, of change that we that. need to make over time. And so that's really important that you continue to provide that direction and that support through our meetings. We have said that this work of Gathering Wisdom 4 and in part Gathering Wisdom 5 is transition. We're moving from that day that Health Canada has control of the Pacific region of First Nations Inuit Health to the day that the First Nations Health Authority has that control of those employees, the resources of the funding. And so that's what we're calling transition. We're not finished that transition work yet. While we're doing the work of transition, we're hearing from so many health directors. We're hearing from so many chiefs. We're hearing so from so many caregivers and health leads that they want change now. They want transformative change now. They want non-insured health benefits, policy, thrown out and, and rewritten so that it meets our needs. Redesigned so that we better provide care and services for our citizens. And they look at other programs and other opportunities and they're asking for that renewal. We're not there yet. We're getting close and we can begin to do some preparation to make sure that we hit the ground running when we are ready for transformation. But that transformation, we're not quite there yet. We need to finish the work of the transfer. We need to finish that work of the transition. And then we'll be ideally situated to carry out the work of transformation. Ideally situated to make sure that our First Nations Health Authority has grabbed onto that steering wheel and that we're deciding where we're going and how we're going to get there as we navigate those currents. So thank you, Leah, for the seven minutes. That you <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Doug. There's a couple of people that are not on mute still, so if you could just check your system to make sure that you're on mute. There will be a chance to ask Grand Chief Doug Kelly some questions after, and I'd like to now turn it over to Joe. <laughs> Thank you very much, Leah, and it's um, really exciting to see all the folks online. It's um, a fabulous way of using the technology to help us connect when it's so difficult to find the time to get together otherwise. So I really appreciate the opportunity to, um, and I'll try and stay with my seven minutes, to. Um, <laughs> provide a bit of an update of where some of the work is at with the First Nations Health Authority. So Grand Chief Kelly over, provided an overview of a lot of the work that we're doing in relation to the transition or the transfer of the First Nations Inuit Health and the headquarter functions that support it. And I think that's really important because uh, I think we all know that um, the, the Fini regional operations really are the arms and legs for what Ottawa is directing. And, and that's a real reason why this change is important. So what's been negotiated through the framework agreement is the transfer of both the regional operations as well as the headquarter functions. So the First Nations Health Authority in doing its work moving ahead is looking at how it um, can meet the, the goal of a seamless transfer as was mentioned by Grand Chief Kelly around services, funding to communities and, and the staff and all those kinds of things, uh, but also has to build the capacity that um, provides the strategic leadership to the running of programs and service design in the province of British Columbia in a manner that will support the work that we will need to do with communities and implementation of the seven directives. The first being community driven, uh, community driven, nation based, uh, right down to the seventh one that talks about operational efficiency. So we know we have a lot of work to do to get there, and that's part of what we're doing now. It's it's very very important to think about um, 
what does the First Nations Health Authority need to achieve by July 2nd, the transfer date, for the seamless um, transfer of services? So today, the First Nations Health Authority, which as was mentioned, has only been the First Nations Health Authority um, for in name uh, for the last month, uh, doesn't really get involved in service responsibility. Today, those service responsibilities still rest with First Nations Inuit Health and with the provincial government. They are the main service providers to First Nations people when they need health services. The, um, the work to create the capacity to take on that service responsibility can be quite complicated when you look at the various aspects of bringing a federal service function into a provincial context. And so we're working through that. And so simple issues like ensuring that um, the nurses that currently work for Health Canada, when they work for us as a provincial society in the province of British Columbia, no longer a federal government employee, can carry out all the functions that they need to in terms of recognition of their scope and practice and so on. So we're trying to ensure those things are there. The same with the, the, um, the, the medical officers in FINI and the ability to perhaps expand some of their functionality so that the doctors can spend more time being doctors and less time being managers and administrators. We can use their skills in a way that better benefits the communities and our people across the province. Uh, same with dental therapists. Um, so we're looking to find solutions in each of those areas. Environmental health officers is another area of major concern to ensure that that functionality can continue seamlessly when we take on transfer. Funding to communities is another important element of this, that on July 2nd, we will, we will be the funder of all of our community health organizations on the ground that are currently funded by Health Canada. So we need to ensure that those mechanisms are in place so that we have and can flow the resources to communities as required in a timely manner and hopefully make improvements to the kind of arrangements that are currently in place to relieve any more of the administrative burden that may already be there that we can. So we will work to try and do that moving forward. Uh, both of those things for us require staff. And so a big part of this transfer is the movement of about um, through the obligations in the framework agreement, we have about 220 um, federal employees that will be part of a reasonable job offer. And so for us to provide that reasonable job offer, there are a number of things that we'll need to be able to do. And, and the reasonable job offer basically um, from the requirements of the, um, the workforce adjustment and, the, and the, the initiatives or the directives that are put in place for um, this kind of a transfer of a federal uh, department out to an organization like the First Nations Health Authority sets out um, the requirement of a comparable kind of employment arrangement. So we have to look at our current organization, the policies and processes and everything else, and look to um, ensure that we can provide that comparable um, employment opportunity for the folks that are coming across and also take care of the staff that we currently have in the organization. So there's a lot of uh, marrying of ideas, if you will, in terms of current First Nations Health Authority policy and process with that of federal policy and processes. And, and at the same time, keeping in mind that what we are building is a First Nations health organization. We're not duplicating a federal bureaucracy that exists in Health Canada. So the culture and the feel of the organization will be a lot different. It'll be a lot more responsive as an organization that will look to be the health and wellness partner of all of our First Nations people and our communities, regardless of where they live in British Columbia. So that takes us to a, a very interesting point where we know that a lot of the federal programs and services that we will receive from Health Canada are really focused on our communities and, and people living in our communities. And that we need to also look to our provincial partnership to provide better support for our First Nations people living outside.